First up, we have Kaylin Doran. Kaylin is a senior in chemical engineering at Benedictine College. Kaylin. Perfect. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Yes. Um, so like Lynn Elsa, my name is Kaylin Doran. Uh, I'm a senior chemical engineer at Benedictine College. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my time with this summer at Painting Manufacturing. Um, it's a relatively small company of quite about 90 people. I make snow management materials, so snow plows, blades, hitches, such things like that. Um, and so uh, they had previously in 2016 when we turned to come and present with them a couple of different projects. Uh, and so moving in here in 2019, they're really hoping to find um, some other creative projects that uh, we're all a little more on a small scale and they can employ and actually implement into their project. Um, and so I'm going to first go over a couple of recommended projects that I um, was able to present them, as well as one that needed more um, research, as well as another that I didn't have to recommend. Um, so, to start off with, I'm going to do press air audit, solar panels um, for replacement for solid side work, some lighting switch, and bathroom door openings. These are the recommended projects that I was able to present them. First, the compressed air audit. So, compressed air systems uh, very frequently have air leaks. Um, you find pinhole leaks in rubber hoses, in you know, the, the hose clamps, valves, such things. And so, what I was able to do was take a UE Ultra Code 9000, and uh, it uses ultrasonic detection so, um, and identify basically locations and the size of these leaks through their system. Uh, I identified 41 different leaks um, with a estimated $14,700 uh, cost avoided that I was really able to do. Uh, working with maintenance, I was able to get 60% of those fixed. Uh, some of those, though, such as the leaks that involve nitrogen, they would require an actual uh, process shutdown, which uh, wasn't able to happen while I was there. So there still is uh, some savings that are available to them, um, but uh, they were able to, just in the 60%, fix about $6,600 um, annually, just from preventing these leaks. Um, there's also a, an interesting uh, side note to this, where a lot of these things, they're small leaks that they can add up. Um, an interesting take I had on this was one of the most common places for leaks is the air pump. And these air couplers attached to the many welding tools that they have, um, just by leaving them plugged in over their 15 minute break, their 30 minute lunch break, um, they lost about $600 a year um, just in leaks during that time. And so identifying those small little little quirks, um, being able to give them opportunities to, hey, let's have everybody unplug the tools, things like that, um, was able to present them those, those options as well. Moving on to solar panels. Um, a lot of this project was spurred by the decreasing uh, um, investment tax credit that is available for solar projects by the federal government. Uh, right now, 2019, and previously, you can get 30% of your entire project back. However, starting next year, that's decreasing to see it at 26%, 23% in 2021, and ultimately down to a 10%. And so really, it was an idea of, um, if we want to do this, let's see what type of project can we do with this current tax credit? So I talked to two different companies, uh, Promo Solar and Solar Design Studio. Promo Solar was able to present a uh, single array, there's 99.9 kilowatts. Um, after the, the incentives and depreciation only came out to about $90,000. Uh, but this one array would save almost $12,000 a year in electricity costs. Um, pay for itself for about seven years and have over $400,000 of a, a lifetime uh, return. Um, solar design studio, however, they took a little more uh, aggressive approach and actually designed four different arrays. Uh, these arrays spanning in size, with, uh, three of them being the 99.8, which is uh, roughly the, the maximum you have on a single meter. Um, this were on the four different meters that were at the facility. Uh, with all of that production, produces over 470,000 kilowatt hours annually. Um, cost after the is about 300,000. 
and would save over $45,000 to $46,000 and pay for itself in the past six years. Um, ultimately, saving $1.6 million over the lifetime. However, the real, I guess, the, the, the great news here is that if they were to implement this system, 67% of their energy would be renewable energy that they're used uh, through all their manufacturing, their offices, their lab care. Um, it was really cool to see, and we could be able to give them that opportunity for that uh, that saving. All right, so that was a lot of numbers I threw out there. Uh, just to recap, we're now here, it's all recycled, we're going to talk about lights, and then back and forth. So the solid recyclers, this deserves a little bit of a story. Um, so when I first got to the, the facility, this machine was not working very well at all. Um, only getting about 30 to 40 percent recovery of their acetone. Basically, what it would do is you put they use acetone to be on the paint lines, you put that, that mixture in this unit, and it would draw out that acetone that you could use. Um, but again, not getting very good recovery. And so we worked with maintenance to try to do some uh, great management maintenance there. We got it working a little bit better. But uh, by the time that I was kind of, my, my time at Eddie was ending, it started breaking down continuously, uh, three times in two weeks. And so he said, something needs to change. And so uh, we looked at some of the issues that we were currently facing with the unit. Uh, one of the issues was overfilling. Uh, they would take these five gallon uh, paint satellites and empty them into the five gallon unit. Um, but these units can't run that when they're filled to the top. It, it uh, reduces the efficiency and sometimes can break the unit. And so to fix that problem as well as increase the processing volume, um, we looked at getting two 6.6 gallon units. Um, I don't know about you, but it seems a little bit difficult to fill a 6.6 gallon tank with a five gallon bucket. So this would inherently keep that from being overfilled. Um, we also, by having two, would have uh, obviously just duplication in case one did break down. Uh, and the increased processing volume meant that it left room for more manufacturing and growth in time. Uh, these first, these uh, two units each were able to be purchased uh, for forty-one hundred dollars. Um, and actually, I did receive word that uh, after I left, they actually did purchase these and are waiting to uh, install them. Um, and so, just because the previous one's going down, by using these units, they were able to they're able to save roughly fifty-five hundred dollars in their solvent because they're able to recycle that and recover that, as well as prevent. So the payback here, under a year, uh, and again, because they've already purchased the units, almost completely implemented that we could make the units. Um, moving on to lighting, I was able to uh, identify, um, well, let me back back a little bit. Thankfully, they've been uh, very interested in updating the LED lighting transitioning over from a lot of their T8 CFLs to uh, T5 ADs. However, their T5s were still there. I believe the T5s they were using were 54 watt volts. <coughs> Many different, um, uh, I guess, 30 different lighting fixtures, and each one held six volts. So a lot of power going into these lights. Um, and so looked at the possibility of changing them also over to a uh, T8 LED, which would make for the first place, a universal bolt for the entire uh, facility, which is nice. Um, but also to save the power. And so by doing that, you can save over 45,000 kilowatt hours, um, over $5,000 of savings. Um, and the uh, annual, and the, the total cost of it was uh, relatively reasonable at um, $4,500, so 100 year payback. However, I will point out one thing, because this was a concern, was that I specified high output T8 LEDs. Uh, this is because the T5s are known for putting out a lot of light. They are able to um, light the area very well. T LEDs are very directionally based, and they don't necessarily put out a lot of light. So I was worried about making this facility fairly dark, which was something that they had already seen a little bit in transitioning over to T5s. So I did a lighting assessment of the facility. Um, this is the building one. 
Um, up in this top section here, uh, near the weld base, they already switched all of those over to uh, T8 LEDs. Um, and what you'll see here is that the recommended light levels for this type of facility is between 500 and 750 lux. Um, those marked in blue are under 100 lux. In red, between 100 and 300. And then in orange, between 300 and 500. And green is within the range. Um, you notice not a lot of green, a little bit more orange, but a lot of red and some blue. So um, the, the use of um, their T8 LED um, as only the one we're using where 1800 is in there um, weren't more cutting. And so I recommend uh, moving up to a 2400 or a 2800 removal, which is um, what the, the cost of implementation represents. Um, to, to frame up their, their space, I mean, it's not necessarily for the workers, but they're more productive and be able to create higher quality products. Um, I also found, as I was identified for them, a $5,000 grant from the city of Blackmore, where they were located, and uh, to help them with their projects that they uh, decided to do a full blown project for us with them. All right, finally, um, the factory motion centers. Being their office space and, and their, their uh, manufacturing space, uh, it's really hard to get people to turn off the lights sometimes. They're still operating on the, the manual switches, and um, oftentimes the light was left on, and it was commented on by many of the, the people there. And so I quickly, using just a uh, total occupancy and light, light meter, was able to track when the lights were on and when people were actually in there take a difference and say, all right, well, if the lights are actually off when the people are gone, what kind of energy is it? And by adding all that up, a little over 3,300 kilowatt hours per year. Not huge. And in fact, um, annually, that would only be about $400. But the cool thing is that because the batteries are relatively small, the sensors themselves don't have to be super big and expensive. Each one is only about $15. And so to actually put these switches in all the bathrooms, only cost 135 and get back super quick. Um, just creating more, uh, I guess, environmentally friendly office space. Um, just that alone puts it in your mind of, yeah, we're being efficient. We want to be efficient. Um, so I would recommend that as well. All right. So moving on to the things I couldn't recommend or even more research. Um, firstly, power factor correction. Um, to talk a little bit about what the power factor is, it's basically when you receive the, the power from the electrical company, there's some of that power that is used to do the work. There's also, uh, you, know, you could call it overhead power, or um, in this case, they call it a reactive power on the side. Um, and it's basically to uh, provide an inductive load on the different uh, machines, to make sure they run, which is necessary. But most of the time, this power is lost. And so, there's a way to implement um, capacitance into the, that circuit, basically to recover that power and make it more efficient. Power companies, uh, because you're you're basically wasting their power if you're if you're not being very efficient with it, will actually pose a <coughs> a, uh, a cost if you're not using it to 90% efficiency. Um, in two cases, on two meters, uh, and so they were underneath this. Uh, this 90% mark. Um, it was pretty immediately evident that fixing both of them would be cost effective. But looking at just the worst of the two, the 78%, we found that the, the um, penalties that they were facing were uh, $1,600 annually just for not having the most efficient circuit. Um, however, it was going to cost about $7,000 to fix uh, based on us uh, from the contractor. And that just wouldn't cut it at the time. However, with this knowledge and, and knowing what uh, I guess it presents, um, other things such as implementing new machines and stuff can, can continually bring this power factor down. And so uh, making them aware of this um, as a possible future project uh, was also really good, but at the time, I could not recommend it. Um, the one I could, uh, that I need more research was uh, looking into their uh, um, sorry about that. Um, looking into uh, filtering and reusing their coolant. 
Um, in most of their their machines, they didn't have any way of filtering out that coolant. And dirty coolant, in this case, can grow bacteria. It can make it unsafe for workers because of that. Uh, they can degrade the machines faster. Um, and so really, using clean coolant is a, a very necessary thing in terms of longevity of your, your process. And so we worked with a company to um, implement a, a small trial period of some of their, their filtering units. Basically, a continuous unit that would, would filter around um, the, the trans oils or metal particulate that was in the coolant. Um, and basically, just make it more, uh, more efficient, cleaner, and less degrading on materials. However, they're still in that trial period. Um, by the time I had to, I had to go. Really, what we were looking at was depending on what units you use and, and how long it extended the life of this coolant, uh, we were looking at possibly having some savings here and in, uh, in, in certain cases, at least, uh, having some savings to uh, present the company. However, um, like I said, I, uh, without hearing anything back from them, without being there myself, I'm not exactly sure to what extent this was uh, either pursued or not pursued. All right, so those are the projects that I would really recommend, um, and also those that I, I put. But there were a couple other things that I did for the company. Um, first of which was I helped them with their sustainability data tracking. Um, their larger group, Alamo group, um, had decided to start um, doing uh, environmental reports annually. And for that, they needed environmental data. So thankfully, they're they're moving, making this this move, this push to, to track and really understand what they're doing. Um, and so I was I helped one of the executives uh, that was taking on this project to find the sources for this data and to figure out an easy way to track it and log it. Um, so we used invoices, purchasing records, um, hazardous waste pickups, potential cleanup reports, and um, I even used way to volume conversion factors. Trash and, uh, and such. So that was able to be organized and presented and continually tracked. I also presented them with an opportunity um, from a, a, actually an outside source that approached me about the opportunity, which was to, uh, it's more of a business perspective of, of using your skills correctly and, and just taking advantage of different taxes that are available or uh, not available to you and making sure that we're all correct. And so I was able to present them this opportunity, basically be a facilitator to say, hey, we should keep you. Then finally, I was able to present them with um, a sustainability statement just for an EPSL. Um, Alamo was doing a great job looking at uh, you know, making these reports, but Nike itself hadn't had any kind of statement directly for their company. And so I did some research, was able to write up a mock proposal, basically saying this is what something could look like. If you wanted to pursue the sustainability of it, this type of statement. Uh, so, in summary, here's a, uh, like I said, a total of the progress I was able to recommend to them um, the compressed air rod, the solar panel evaluation, solvent recycler, the lighting replacement, and the motion sensors. Altogether, saving a ton of power, over 600,000 kilowatt hours annually, um, saving some waste from that solvent recycler, and giving the, the company an opportunity to save $76,000 annually if they would actually pursue all of these, these projects. Um, all that in terms of uh, GHG reductions, almost 650 metric tons of CO2 total. Um, absolutely. And so, are there any questions? I have a question or two if you, if no one else does. So I always think of things and write them down. Um, I, was, I was curious on a, a couple of um, points. I'm assuming that you included the 30% tax credit in your calculations. They reflect, reflected that. Yeah. So they would know for this year. Okay. And, um, and do you know um, the cost of the nitrogen versus the compressed air? What I, what is, I've never looked at the cost of that. Do you know what the cost is? So it's obviously, um, so the cost of 
nitrogen versus air, so it has to be supplier. Um, air can you can get relatively cheap if you're just compressing on the CSI. Right, right. right. Electricity, which I believe was uh, 12 cents um, per thousand cubic feet. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to remember numbers from a while ago, so I don't know if it's anything. Um, as far as nitrogen, I believe it was. $1.72. Okay, I was assuming it was quite a bit more yeah, expensive. Five more. times, you know, yeah. um, and almost so 10 times, sounds like. Of the 41 things I found, uh, I believe only maybe four or five of those were actually nitrogen related. But that encompassed uh, 40%, 30 to 40% of the total, I guess, cost of pollutants out there. Okay. Just because of that cost. Of the gas. And do you know, um, you mentioned they were using acetone for their. The paint gun wash. Um, do, have they always used that? Do you have any idea on the history? Because I, I think they changed that, which is a lot less toxic um, solvent than some of the other solvents maybe they've used in the past. I didn't know if, if you knew the history on that. Yeah, as far as their history with the acetone versus not acetone, um, I, I believe there was a previous time they were using, but that was many years before I got there. Okay. And so, as far as I they you know, they were even, I guess, cognizant of the different uh, products that were available and what we were talking about. It was always an acetone. Okay. So that's been a great. Effect. Well, I'm glad to hear they're using acetone now. So Absolutely. that's yeah. great. This may be taking things far, but I got to think big picture. Uh, going through all the things, and you can tell me I didn't get, I didn't even think that way. But going through all that, um, did you develop an opinion on the reduction of the cost share or the um, tax credit for solar panels? What idea about it? I mean, like, because I mean, you see pretty good savings, and we're already in the downward tail for small business greenhouse gas reduction. Should we be reducing that, or should we not, as a federal policy? Um, I'm not sure if I can make an educated comment on, I guess, the federal policy or not, but I really reduce that simply because uh, I don't know what's going on on the federal side. Um, at the business side, yes, give us a tax credit. Make it easier for us to do this and, and you know, make more renewable energy. Um, but without knowing exactly what it's costing the United States and then all of the business Big savings, though. I tend to say that it's too bad that we're not continuing to push. Yeah, it. it's a seven-year seven payback, right? Right. If I remember the numbers right. And we know that businesses typically one to two years is what they're looking for. So they're not taking that even. Okay. So, so maybe that's well, part of the plan yeah. the issue as well. Yeah, I mean that's where we that's what we typically see. And Lisa can correct me if I'm wrong because she that across the, the nation. But typically we're looking at two years max for implementation rates okay. being as, yeah. Okay. And maybe that's part of the, the whole program as well. I mean, I just, I'm always looking for that renewable energy just for something I might right. <laughs> And I think the sites, and what I'm being curious about, the sites payback period being a little longer than one or two years, being seven for almost eight in this circumstance. What is the life cycle of these? I mean, how often do you have to, you know, what is the repair, the replacement that cycle for the Do you find any information about that? Yeah. <coughs> it divides them during cases where something happens, they're really, but they will last uh, something like 40, about 25 years. Years of use after possible, yeah. Okay. So that, I mean, that factors into, I think, whether or not payback in seven and a half years or 7.7 .7 is worth it or not. 